called Mad Dog Prosecutors and Other Hazards of American Business. Uh, my, every American who cares about justice should read this book, so says Alan Dershowitz, the famous attorney. I would second that it is a frightening story, and it's a local story. Uh, it's sort of fun to read through and recognize the names of the people involved. So I'd like to welcome you, Michael. Thanks for coming out. Good to and see you, Joanna. <laughs> maybe you can tell me um, a little bit about the circumstances that forced you to write this book. Well, it's been well publicized in our area, at least in a tabloid style. But behind the scenes, what really went on was a shocking example of abuse of our legal system. One that I found out through my own experience is quite widespread in our society. And the reason I wrote this book is because I was brought up to believe in the Constitution and proud of being an American, and I still am in a lot of ways. But what I found out is that our legal system and our system of justice is absolutely out of control. And there's horror stories galore of people who are just ground into submission, both in civil litigation and in criminal litigation. And being, uh, I guess, a victim, but one who survived and came through this process and reclaimed my life and came back into our community, I decided that I had a story to tell so that other people who are confronted with the same situation have a roadmap and they have the ability to understand uh, what it is that's unfolding in front of them. When they see the headlines, they can see behind the headlines. Well, in the Freeman folks, as we all know, the headlines leave a lot to be desired. Uh, one of the reasons I'm doing what I'm doing here is because the Freeman has neglected to cover these issues in depth. They refuse to report on the details of the family court system. And so when you have a free press, uh, very often it may be free, but um, I like to think of it very often, unfortunately, as being run by advertising, attorneys, uh, fear of large corporations, um, backlash. As you know, you were, now what I found interesting was you were in the forefront of the alternative energy uh, movement. You were one of the people, it seems, from your story here, who was really one of the um, people who made money through your ideals. You were very idealistic in the 60s about f pursuing solar energy and alternative forms of uh, energy. And back that in the was my life. That, that was okay. and has been my life for my entire adult life, is pursuit of the renewable energy field and environmental issues. And uh, I built a, a company with a dream and uh, determined to make a difference in the world. Now, it seemed that that was a, everything worked out for you. A lot of us have had that dream, but many of us haven't made money at that, you know? Right. But you were lucky enough to make money, and therefore, as I understand it, uh, our congressman in 1992, Maurice Hinchy, before he, when he was running for office against yes. Juanita Craig. When he was assemblyman. When he was an assemblyman, and he was yes. going to run for Congress, right? Yes. He came to you, and what did he actually ask you? Well, he asked me to uh, be his finance chairman for his campaign. And uh, the details of the story are quite complex, and, uh, but it turned out that there were uh, vulnerabilities that, that happened as a result of my involvement. I was a naif. I was naive, never been involved in politics before that campaign, and had never been involved in politics since that campaign. It was an adventure. I took it on willingly. I just grabbed a hold of it and ran with it. Unfortunately, I didn't know what I was doing. And the people who were involved in the campaign on Maurice's side, they took advantage of the situation to have me raise money for them. And as a result, I exposed myself and my company to uh, a great deal of legal uh, anxiety and turmoil, uh, and quite unnecessarily so. It was a horror story that unfolded Now, isn't that. it true that the laws for campaign uh, financing were in went through a, a tremendous metamorphosis that year, 92. Weren't there a lot of new guidelines that well, had it, come it down? Wasn't, it wasn't so much that there were new guidelines, it's just that the guidelines and the processes are very obscure. Mm -hmm. And the real issue that I discovered in, this, in, this, in the course of these events is that the issue is not whether you break the law or you commit any uh, regulatory breach. 
because regulatory breach happens <laughs> in everybody's life at some form or another, even if it's a speeding ticket. Okay? I don't even know what regulatory breach means Bre in means, terms of a mm. fundraising for a, a well, uh, you know, if Maurice came to me and asked me to raise money and I was rich and had a you know, I, I'm not quite sure, but I would think that they made you aware of the regulations of what was proper, what was improper. Did you have a lawyer who could help you out well, with this? Well, actually, it was Maurice Hinchy's lawyer, who was the campaign lawyer, who was, in my opinion, much more interested in getting money for the campaign than in protecting me from any potential allegations of, of impropriety. But you never even anticipated that while you were going no, through. No, I didn't, you know. because what I did is I got the legal advice. I thought what I did was appropriate, mm -hmm. and it was aggressive but appropriate, legal. I mean, I would never have intentionally broken the law. I have no incentive. I mean, I wanted Maurice in Congress at that time, and I, but right. I didn't want him that bad that I would intentionally right. go out and break the law to do it. But he, of course, being a Democrat in a Republican district, right. and just being a politician, they all have enemies. I That's mean, right. Ken Starr obviously but, but wanted Clinton out of office for a lot of reasons. But it, so wasn't, I wanted to, Maurice, you know. it wasn't Maurice Hinchy's enemies that precipitated the... Uh, legal problems. It was the enemies that were trying to invade my company. Uh, okay, could you expand upon that? Okay. Because I'm not, I'm sort of beginning that part, the corporate raiders. Yes. Because we all read about that, well, but we're I, not quite sure what that means. Having started this company in a garage and built it up from nothing, I just assumed that all you got to do is do the right thing, build up the company, make money, and everybody's happy. Well, our legal system doesn't work that way. In fact, when you start making money in the business world, especially as a public company, uh, what I found out is that there is a whole industry out there of class action attorneys and stockbrokers that prey on companies that are just about to make money or are making money, and they do it with vicious litigation designed to extract payola. It's actually like like a mob infiltration, except that the people wear suits and they call themselves legitimate people, but what they do is they file lawsuits and try to extract money. Uh, as it turns out, in our particular case, uh, I stood up to them, I wouldn't pay them off, and we ended up in a long, drawn-out litigation war. Uh, How much would you say that cost your company? Millions. Roughly. Millions, millions of dollars. Millions of dollars, so. aside from the diversion of attention of the top management team from the business. But what happened here, when we stood up to the Raiders, these are very vicious people and they do this all the time, dozens and dozens and in dozens In other words, they sit on Wall Street or wherever and they decide they want to acquire your company. Or they want to liquidate it, but it's, that's only one of the goals. One of the other goals is we'll go away if you pay us off. Oh, like okay. the mafia kind it's of like, thing. It's like, yeah. it's like the mob, and that's why I say that. Uh, they, they, How about going when people go public with that? What if yes. you were to have gone public with that and named names? Well, it, it, it's all in the book. Okay. But, but it really doesn't matter because these people do it with impunity, and they go in court, and they make allegations, and they try Allega and, Oh, it sounds just like divorce. Yeah. You go in court, and they make allegations, they tell lies, and then the onus is on you, the innocent person, this to is defend exactly yourself. It. This is is exactly it the same it. in business? Well, but, I this just, is, yeah. but this is what's in many ways wrong with our legal system, even on the civil justice side. People can go into court and make all kinds of unfounded allegations. If they have the money. If they have the money. But and these the time. Are, but these are well-heeled people who do this for a living. And if they sue dozens of companies and only a small portion of them, uh, they lose because they get paid off. Most companies pay these people off instead of litigating with them because they're so vicious and it's so dangerous to litigate with them. But I didn't know. I was just a street. Yeah, you... I was just a street fighting entrepreneur, and I just had, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take this kind of crap. So I litigated yeah. with them instead of paying them off. What they did is they instigated the government. And what I found out, which was an amazing thing, it was a so revelation to me. So they went to, to the government. Um, they okay. found out enough about your what, books. What, to, no, actually, uh, what what they did, it had nothing to do with right or wrong. What they did is they began an organized campaign of making false complaints to government agencies designed to instigate the forces of law enforcement in the government. Now, let me, let me give you some background on what law enforcement has become in our society. See, we live, most of us live our lives just kind of going from day to day and not even conscious of law enforcement because thankfully most people don't encounter it. They see a headline. You know, they read about somebody getting prosecuted or somebody plea bargaining to something, 
and they have no idea what it's really about. But over the last generation, the Congress has criminalized all kinds of bureaucratic regulations. A generation ago, there was the FBI, and then there was all these federal agencies that had regulations. Over the course of the last generation, so many minor regulations have now, violation of them have become criminal offenses. And the only difference between a civil enforcement and a criminal enforcement mm -hmm. is that you get the attention of a prosecutor who decides they want to take you down. And this happened in my case. And the reason it happened is because these, these uh, parties instigated the government to come after me. Well, how did this interface with Maurice Hinchy's uh, campaign? Was, he, was this going on simultaneously? You were fundraising for well, Maurice? Well, the, the thing with Maurice was a one-time, three-month period in my life. Yeah, but you went to jail for six months. Right, because but what of... happened is the prosecutor came after me five years later with a massive fishing expedition designed to find crimes. I see. Okay, so what they did is they took out 80 file cabinets of uh, drawers full of documents from the company, had an army of investigators trying to figure out a way to indict me. This is the United States of America, by and the way. And we're paying, all right. of us out there, remember, we're paying these people salaries. I mean, in the Soviet Don't forget, Union, right? you think about in the Soviet Union, the forces of the bureaucracy and the government going after somebody and ripping their life apart, trying to figure out a way to throw them into the gulag, okay? In our society mm -hmm. right now, these kinds of things are happening where the criminal justice bureaucracy and the regulatory arms of the United States will target somebody and try and take them out. But what were the specific charges that they ended well, up putting you in jail for? When they could, I mean, what when, was that? Yeah, with more, As okay. I recall, it had something to do with campaign, um, finance. campaign finance. When they couldn't find any real crimes to indict me on because I do run a clean company. I've been in business 25 years. It's a public reporting company, and we just don't Bessa Corp is the name of the corporation right. for those of you out there who may not know. When, when they couldn't find any, any crimes, uh, basically they made the allegation that five years before I had reimbursed people for campaign contributions. Now, had I been able to present my defense, I would have been able to prove that everybody who received their their bonuses, they allege that people got bonuses to make campaign contributions. Had I been able to go to trial, I would have been able to prove that everyone who got bonuses were entitled to them and made the contribution of their own volition, their own free will. And the entire amount of this case was $27,000. In Washington, D.C., people routinely raise millions of dollars for political campaigns and do it in very shady ways and they never get prosecuted. The difference is, is that we have a government which is willing to selectively prosecute, turn over, uh, turn people's lives inside out uh, on, a, on a very selective and targeted basis. Well, it's a bias in the courts, basically. It's a bias. But didn't they have to justify all their investigating? So they had to do something. They had well, to come up with something. You're on to a very important point, Joanne. Uh, once the prosecution apparatus invests money in prosecuting somebody. I mean, look at Ken Starr. Right. He spent how many million? $44 40, million, million dollars. Dollars of our money right. to talk about the president's sex life? Right. I mean, once is, they, it, is one, it similar? It's a similar thing. But once they invest in prosecuting somebody, they have to get something. Now, what I found out from being involved in this process, and my attorney told me very early on, 90 plus percent of the people who were targeted plea bargain. Well, why? I didn't intentionally break the law. I want to go to trial and be acquitted. I found out that was plea a Plea bargain, you have to sit, plead guilty. You have to plead guilty to something. Unlike civil litigation, you can go into court and settle civil litigation just by shaking hands with your adversary. I'm going to pay you a certain amount of money. You're going to pay me. Everybody walks away. With criminal, you can't With do criminal that. case, if you want to settle a criminal case, you have to plea bargain to something. Okay? It's something that there's no other way to end the madness, and which is why the power of the government has become so intense and so heavily used against ordinary citizens that well over 90% of the people who were investigated in a prosecution plea bargain to something because their lawyers tell them, you just can't stand up to the federal government. You can't withstand the pressure.
Now, that's basically all of Clinton's people who were investigated, who were not the President of the United States and didn't have the financial resources. A lot of these people were wiped out by legal fees. Well, most people Because are. they were told, you know, they're going to say that it was like, you give us something on the President, or whatever they did. Right. Now, what I'm curious about, you so you went to jail. You said, I didn't do anything wrong, and I'm going to go well, spend the six months in jail. The way, the way, the way my case was, was handled, uh, they, they charged the case so seriously. The prosecutor has the ability to determine under the, under the sentencing system how long of a sentence you're facing if you go to trial. So I was, if I went to trial and I tried to prove my innocence, I was facing years in prison over absolutely nothing. I see. So my lawyer said, your best bet to save your life is to plea bargain to something. And he said, I can't guarantee you that you're not going to be sentenced to prison, uh, but I can tell you if you do this, it's going to be the shortest possible So you time. spent six months. Well, I didn't expect that. I expected and was hoping for some sort of home confinement or probation. As it turns out, the plea bargain process was so skewed against me and the government was so heavy-handed, so out of proportion to reality, that I was unable even to present mitigating evidence or facts after I pleaded guilty. And the whole story of that is told in the book of how, how the process doesn't work how the government can use this process to basically destroy right. anybody. And it, by the way, it, it's very clearly and simply written. It is very compelling. And I'm really enjoying it because I know all the people. Right. But I have to say that this is what is done every day in our, and our country is the best. Can you imagine being, I mean, a totalitarian country is worse. But our country is, this is terrible. Well, well, this is terrible injustice. Well, let, let me just but, tell you, you know. Joanne, that the United States system, what separates our system from a police state? And that's a good question we have to ask ourselves. A police state does not have to have a figurehead at the top like an Adolf Hitler or a Mussolini or a Stalin. You can have a bureaucracy with nameless, faceless people who are using the power of the federal government, the awesome power of the federal government, to ruin individual people. And if you can't stand up to the power, if you can't go to court and declare your innocence, confront your And you accusers, had the money to do it if you chose to do it, which most of us most don't. Most people are destroyed. Right. I, met a, I met a lot of really good people in the system when I was incarcerated. Yeah, I want to ask you about what it was like to be in jail, because well, that's something. You know, let's remember, folks, O.J. Simpson didn't spend any time in jail, and this man here spent six months. That's our system. Let me give you. So you let know, me, tell let me, me you, about that. Who was in there? I want to give you. You were in a, a white little, collar prison, more well, or less. Well, no. Right? Let no? me explain what happened, and I want to just give you an example mm -hmm. of the kind of prosecutorial abuse that was rampant, not only in my case, but that I've seen throughout the entire system. When I was sentenced, the judge, recognizing that I'm a family person with a business and I've never broken the law before, he wanted to sentence me to some time simply because he was poisoned by the vicious diatribes that the prosecution had, uh, had laid out for him that I was unable to refute. So he sentenced me to six months, but he gave me the right to self-surrender, which means you go to the prison and you walk yourself in, it's a minimum security institution, it is not a country club, but you go and you serve your time in a less dangerous, less hostile environment. What do you do every day there? Let me just tell you yeah. what happened. After an 18 month investigation, I was not summoned before the grand jury at all. Not during the investigation, not during the plea bargaining process, not during the sentencing process, and not dealing with not during the time leading up to my surrender. The day that I surrendered to the prison camp, the prosecutor served what is called a writ for my appearance in front of a grand jury. <laughs> he waited until the very day I was in custody to serve a writ. Now what happened as a result of that? Two days later, they took me out of the prison in chains with leg irons, handcuffs, and hauled me through for four days through the maximum security bowels of the worst federal institutions in the, in the eastern United States, all going on route to a county jail. And I spent three and a half months in a county jail in Westchester to make three grand jury appearances. Where was Mr. Hinchy? 
Oh, he was. Couldn't off. he help you? He was. <laughs> off. He didn't know anything. Wait, I didn't L know anything. L let me, let this me... is the man you raised funds for, and you're in chains, and this man doesn't know anything. Well, hey, I think we all better look a little more carefully at well, what he's, you know, getting involved I'm... with him. <laughs> Joanne, really, Joanne. I just want to make the point to close out that point that the only reason that happened is because the prosecutor intentionally decided to use the heavy hand of the United States government to screw me further to the wall after I was sentenced. This is the United States. Okay, my family and my lawyer, they couldn't even find me for days on end. I was in the bowels of the system being hauled around. And then, rather than following the judge's will to put me into a minimum security institution, I spent three and a half months of my sentence in a county jail, maximum security. Okay? So, just to give you an idea, and I met some very good people who were screwed around by the system. This is called diesel therapy. This is where people are taken and brought from one institution to the other to soften them up and shake them up and they don't have anything but the shirt on their back they have no money they have no toothbrush and when they get set up in one institution they get put onto a train or a bus or 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 a van and brought to another institution they do this to shake people up and to soften them up and that was what was done to me this is the united states of america now I would still rather be here than in the old Soviet Union, but I was brought up to believe that the United States was something better and something much more humane. Well, there's a whole club of us, Michael, just to make you feel better, although your story happens to be the worst. But my friend John Hurd would agree. He came on here and said the same thing. I thought it was the United States of America. You know, we grew up during the 60s. We believed that we could make this country better. We believed that there was some justice out there if you told the truth. Uh, what you're telling me, what he found, what I discovered, and I don't want to even compare my crummy dealings with the Ulster County Family Court to what you went through because it's frightening what you went through. But it is frightening the power that these so-called government employees have. You didn't vote those people into office. We vote these people in the family court into office every 10 years so we should pay attention but, the but bureaucracy, this is frightening the and it is frightening the bureaucracy is really where the police state is going to come from in, a, in the united states well we meet bureaucrats every day i mean i i met one at the my book signing at brentano they, these are morons who have positions of power but we laugh them off every day me, but if your life is in their hands i mean these people were bringing you dinner every night let right me just, let, me just, let me just make an important point the people who work in the criminal justice system, they're our friends and our neighbors and people we see every day. And within that system are many good people. The problem is the bad people in that system can get away with it, get away with abusing their power. So the problem is not that every person is bad. The problem is that the system is wide open for the really sociopathic people that exist within that system to screw other American citizens. And that has to be Stop. But if you're a prisoner and you're treated terribly by some ex person, you can't get their name and report, write a letter, you know, and copy the, co mm -hmm. you know, what do you do? I mean, that must have been quite an experience. Well, you, I, you were, I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely floored. Well, I don't jo mean to laugh. But Joanne, I, I considered it um, an out of body experience. The only way I survived is I just said, I'm going to deliver my body into this horrible process, but I'm going to keep my soul strong, my spirit strong, keep my family together, and I keep my love and my, my heart, and I'm just not going to allow this to ruin me. And that's why when, I, when this was all over, I came back, I took my position back in my company, I brought the company through uh, a, a wonderful <coughs> merger and into some great new, uh, new, new business ventures, kept my family together in great difficulty and in a lot of pain. And uh, but I've gone on with my life, and I'm, I wrote this book to tell the story of not only how this happens to me and how it happened to me, but how it's happening all across our society to other ordinary people. And even though I have a successful company, I mean, I started in a garage in Ellenville, New York, and I'm just an ordinary guy <coughs> who got into a position where I was a target. 
And that can happen to anybody. It can happen to you in your divorce. Oh, hey, okay? I've already been, a, I got nothing left to lose. That's right. <laughs> but let me ask you something, since um, I can't let you off without asking you. Sure. Um, we are all a little bit confused and distressed by the possibility of a newspaper recycling plant in our backyard. Now, can I, I mean, Go ahead. my theory Shoot. is, this is a great idea. We need to recycle. We all know that. Why can't it go to Cementon? I know many of you out there in the Hudson Valley have no idea what I'm talking about, but Cementon is where the cement plants are. And it's right on the Hudson. And somehow it's always been a sort of place for that kind of thing. But, but you've been turned down, and I read in the paper recently uh, by Kingston, by Saugerties. No, that's not, that's not exactly okay. so. Well, tell me. The, we we the... voluntarily left the East Kingston site because it was not suitable. Okay? It was but right Boyce's Lane. I'm no. no. We, we tried to do this in Saugerties. We ran into a lot of uh, local anxiety. Okay? Well, Which... the stench is what seems no, no, to no. be the well, problem. Let me, let me just okay. make something very, very clear. Okay? The project we're doing there to me, and I spent my entire life working in renewable energy and the cutting edge environmental technologies. It is an absolutely <laughs> clean, stellar, beautiful project for cleaning up our environment and recycling and ending the deforestation of our wilderness and the destruction of natural resources and the throwaway society that we live in. Unless our society implements the kind of technology and infrastructure for recycling and clean power generation, we're just going to continue doing the same thing the same old way and basically ripping off the planet, deforesting wilderness, landfilling newspapers and burning them in incinerators and producing power with coal. If people are patient, what they will see is that this project is absolutely clean, benign, quiet, and a beautiful ecological project designed to move our society to the next level of cleanliness and okay, recycling. Okay, then why is it that several plants that have been built in the country, similar, are supposedly emit a noxious fumes? Into, first, first of I, all... I mean, that's my only question. I, okay, I don't... first of all, if, if in due course, over the course of the development of this project, people will go to see actual plants that do the same mm -hmm. thing. Uh, the supervisor of the town of Ulster, prior to taking office, visited a plant in Syracuse, New York, that is comparable. And it was quiet, clean, no odor. In fact, uh, Cliff Miller, who is the president of Ulster Savings Bank, on his own volition went down to Georgia to visit an identical <coughs> newspaper recycling plant, came back and said it's absolutely clean and pristine and a good neighbor and quiet and a really good industrial project. Now, my opinion as an environmentalist, and I'm, I consider myself a radical environmentalist, right. I am 100 percent in favor of total corporate accountability for environmental pollution. Uh, no compromises, no nothing. And the standards, the permitting standards that we are supposed to meet in our society, in New York State are as stringent as any, anywhere else in the country. but. They, to me, only represent the minimum standard. The project that we're going to build is going to be as, as perfect as can be economically justified. The real issue, though... That's a strange phrase. No, but, no. Yeah. I mean, this is reality. We're going to beat the permit standards, and we're going to go as far towards zero as possible. But we have to understand the issue of creating mass hysteria by, by telling the most outrageous exaggerations about this project. There are people in our community and in our society that do not want any industrial development, okay? The issue of this project is not whether it's a clean project or a dirty project, because I can tell you if it was an environmentally destructive project, I wouldn't do it in the first place. It goes, it's the antithesis of mm -hmm. everything I've spent my life doing. But for those people who do not want any industrial development in the Hudson Valley, Sorry, I mean, well, I don't agree. Look at okay. Kingston. I mean, look what we've got there now. I mean, between well, all these, this development. So it can't be the development because we've got so much but, development. But, but the point is there are people who do not want industrial development and they are willing to tell the most outrageous lies and exaggeration in order to stop mm -hmm. the project before it even gets off the ground. Now, let me just say something, Joanne. My daughter grew up in this community. 
I met many of her friends over the course of her educational experience, and the kids who grew up in this, who grow up in this community, who want to work in this community, and even those kids who aren't fortunate enough to go to college, there is really no life for them. There's no way to own homes, raise families, and be part of a family, a part of a good life. And I think they're entitled to that. I think there's a place for industry in our society. I think there's a need for new development of clean technologies, ways for people to, to make, a, make, uh, make our environment better. And I think over a period of time, when the facts get known, we will never satisfy the hysteria, we will never stop the fear mongers, mm -hmm. but part of leadership in our society, part of going forward and doing things that are going to make the next generation mm -hmm. cleaner than the past generation, is being able to stand up to demagoguery and say, you're not telling the truth, here's what this project is really about, and hope that the vast majority of people who are open-minded take a look at the facts, take a look at the number mm -hmm. of smart, educated, people and political leaders and economic leaders and business leaders who take the time to look at what we're doing and support it. Well, I, un I understand. I'm glad you came by to share this because it mm. really was enlightening, as I'm sure yeah. many of you will think. And certainly, I'm impressed that you're not angry and bitter and uh, bearing a gun after you got out of the maximum well, securities prison because, frankly, after what they put you through, whatever you did hey there are people who got you that. didn't deserve that no so problem. i really admire you and i just want to hold up the book and uh, show you folks out there uh it's a beautiful job the book was published by station hill press in barrytown and it's available in barnes and noble and you can Pick it up there or at other bookstores. It's one of the uh, local. Have, I'm doing publishing. a book signing Friday night at seven o'clock. In Barnes Friday. and Noble in Poughkeepsie. Right on the yes. 11th, and uh, and I'm excited about it. The book is getting some good good well, press, and it's, I'm doing it's a lot very of radio well written. Shows. Yeah, it's Thank very you. well written. Thank you very and much. I, I appreciate your coming here. I know you have a lot of other things to do, and I wish you a lot of luck with the book, and with um, your project. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, really. Okay. And I, you know, thanks right. again. I appreciate right. it. It's a pleasure to be here. Take care. Hi, I'd like to welcome my second guest, Dasho Kim Gibson of New Paltz, who has come to join me and tell us all about a very, very um, horrifying period of history in the world. And um, maybe you can begin with, I guess, is this your book or what yes. book? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, Silence Broken. Mm -hmm. and. Um, how did you get involved with the stories of the so-called comfort women, the 200,000 Korean women who were virtually sexual slaves to the Japanese uh, soldiers during the war, uh, World War II? How did you become involved in this? Uh, as you can see from my looks, um, 
I'm a Korean American. I was born in North Korea when Korea was under Japanese colonialism, and um, our family came to South, that's Seoul, Korea, in 1945 after country was independent from Japanese imperialism as a result of the end of World War II. And I spent most of my adult life in Seoul. And in 1962, I came to the United States with um, 44 pounds luggage and the dream of a foreign student to pursue graduate studies. I landed in Boston, Logan Airport in 1962. And I actually studied um, philosophy, religion, comparative religion. And after I got my PhD, I went to Mount Holyoke College to teach. And then what did you I, teach there? I, I taught comparative religion and philosophy of religion. And I was there almost for 10 years. And um, then after that, um, I had my second career, which was um, <laughs> working at the National Endowment for the Humanities in the media program. And it was uh, during the time when I was in Washington, D.C., that a group of Koreans in that community invited a former comfort woman by the name of Grandma Hwang Gunju. And they invited me to come and translate her testimony in front of a lot of television cameras and uh, What year was that, approximately? It was in 1992, November. Oh, so yeah. that's only in the last uh, yeah, eight years. Yeah, seven years ago and something like that. And uh, at first, I was just uh, really concentrating on her Korean words, every one of it, to um, do an accurate, exact translation of what she was saying and to put away my emotion. But as I sat beside this woman, who was about 70 years old, and listened to her story, and at one point, she forgot that there was all these cameras in front of her, and she just grabbed my shoulder and uh, said, do you have any idea what it was like? These people had no notion that for us Korean women, chastity was more precious than life itself. Do you have any notion what it was like to be a sexual slave for these imperial soldiers of Japan? And then she started trembling. Her whole body trembled. And the tremors that went through her body came to me like electricity, and after that, my life has never been the same. So I was drawn into the life of this, this woman, and I actually started uh, doing a research, and at that time, there were not too much material, because this issue has been silenced for half a century. And that's exactly why the title of my film is Silence Broken. Silence was only broken after 50 years. And um, why do you think, um, I'm sure, you know, you've been here for 38 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, you see what's in the press. Uh, everything from, uh, you know, movie stars' uh, innermost secrets to the president's sex life. Why would something as important, I mean, this involved 200,000 Korean women. Why would this not have emerged? I mean, we certainly in America didn't learn about it in our history books in school. That I can tell you. But why do you think that is? Well, it is a very simple case of discrimination, and I would call it triple discrimination. Actually, however, I would like to correct that uh, the number of these women who were put on the Japanese sexual servitude, roughly at 200,000, it could be more, it could be a little less. Nobody can really come up with exact scientific objective number. So it's a rough number of 200. And out of 200,000 women who were taken as sex slaves by Japanese, about 80 to 90% were Korean women. But the women came from all over Asia, uh, the colonies, which meant Korea and Taiwan, and then the occupied territories by Japanese soldiers. And there were some uh, few Dutch women and some Australian nurses even. So the women came from all over. And so I just wanted to emphasize that it was not just Korean women. Okay. The only reason why I'm saying Korean women in my book and in my documentary is because uh, I cannot deal with all of it, and the more focused because you are, the better it is for, for work. And it was natural for me because I'm a Korean American. 
and uh, there were majority of those people who, who are Koreans. So why was it not written up? Why was it not a media attention, all of that? Well, in 1945, when the end of the Second World War came, as you know, there was a Tokyo Tribunal which was conducted by General MacArthur, and the tri tribunal lasted um, less than three years. Under that uh, system, a lot of things were uh, punished and war criminals were brought to the fore and all of that. But for General MacArthur and the Allied forces, some of the things were just not important enough to talk about and in fact some of these issues were put under the rug and bargained away and the three issues that were bargained away with Japanese were cannibalism, the case of comfort woman and the other is Japanese radical medical experimentation, the most because we only hear of Mengele for, in for, Germany for but I don't remember now, the Japanese. Oh yes, the most famous one is 371 unit where all these people, Japanese, put Chinese, all these people, and just did, the, in some, some cases, uh, live human beings were used to do experimentation. So those issues were put under the bargain. Uh, General MacArthur exchanged for quieting these issues, the information the Japanese got from this medical experimentation, so they were bargained. The reason why we were quieted is because, of course, some of these, not most these of these women, women ever came, get, yeah, get money came to, from, ever paid? No. came from uh, poor classes, poor people, and were they, were they European, American women, it would have never been quieted down, but it was Asian woman, and um, it was powerless people who were going through this powerful legal system or tribunal. So they were, and then it, of course it was a woman's issue, the most important. So wait, wait, wait. So, so they gender were gender discrimination. They it's were a, poor, it's they were issue, women, and they were Asian. Asian. So it's a yeah. racial, class, and gender discrimination. So it was quieted down. And it was also no, 1945. Yeah, right? and 1948. Nobody, yeah. nobody wanted to take care of this. So people who are directly responsible for this to begin with, and then for this, why was it silenced for all that long? The people who are most responsible for this is needless to say Japanese. And then I don't forgive the Korean government for this either because um, if Korea was strong enough not to be a colony of Japan to begin with, it would not have happened. But um, beyond that, when war ended and when Korea was negotiating with Japan to talk about the aftermath of colonialism and Second World War. For Korean politicians, needless to say, all male, they did not think this woman's issue was important enough to bring on the table. And then, of course, allied forces, more specifically United States, that was the strongest power, did not think this little case of Asian woman important enough. So they did not want to deal with it. You know? What about any American journalists at the time? It seems to, the way the press works today, it was not like that many years ago, but one would think there was some journalist who would have picked up uh, on this and made some kind of issue. But I guess in the context of the 1950s, and 1945, would, and, the 45, and 1965, I, I, and all of that. So it, it it's was, interesting to me that it's, uh, it, it's taken this long, but oh. I, it makes. But as you're talking, it's starting to make more sense. You would be surprised you know? how many issues have been silenced because I, it's mostly you know power, powerless people, politically mm -hmm. powerless, economically underclass, and in many cases women, gender discrimination, and all of those things. So that's why it was silenced. Only recently, around the early 1990. Uh, some of these 
formal comfort woman started to come Speak out. Speak out. So that's how the silence was broken. Also, At their generation, it wouldn't be typical for them to talk out in public about this. Like you say, it's really a no, shameful it's, it's kind not, of thing. No, then, it's not right? just a generation. The people, sociologists, the scholars, the activists, politicians, they attribute the reason for this long-held silence to be largely because women themselves did not want to talk about it because they were ashamed. It was and like rape was so, at one so time. Th that's, yeah. that's what they say. But so when I went around in South Korea, Japan, and China to interview these com former comfort women, to each and every one of them, I put forth this question. Were you ashamed? Is that why you did not want to talk about it? There was this really refined, graceful grandma. Her name is Jung Seo Eun. She was the only daughter whose father was a landowner who was imprisoned by Japan. And she was deceived into going into this because they promised that if she went to Japan to work in a factory, then on the day when she left for a couple of years in this factory, her father would be released. So that's how she ended up being a sex slave for seven years. She's one of my main characters in my documentary and also in the book. But uh, when I put this question in front of her, she said, She's very calm, very dignified woman. She usually speaks very quietly. But um, when I asked this question, the voice of her voice went one octave higher, and she was very excited, and she said, no way. Why should I be ashamed? I was never ashamed. It's the <coughs> Japanese and Japanese government who did that horrible thing to us. They are the ones who should be ashamed. I was never ashamed. It's that. I, I told everybody, to my neighbors, <laughs> to everybody when I came back, but society did not want to hear about it. They were the ones who were ashamed of us, wanted to repress us, but uh, I wasn't ashamed. And a lot of other women told the same thing. Yes, on the other hand, many of these women, they know with their head that it was not their fault, but what happened they think it was a shameful thing. So they are ashamed. So I'm not denying that some of the women are ashamed, but it's not their shame as much as people make it out. They're silenced. It's the friends, it's the neighbors, it's even sometimes in the case, in many cases, families, it's the politicians, it's powerful people who did not want to hear about it. They are the yes. ones who are ashamed. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it, I think fundamentally there might be a difference in the culture here because somehow I feel if women came back to their husbands their families after that happened in this country there would be a tremendous outpouring and outcry maybe I'm wrong but I just feel there would be hell to pay and a lot of people would be writing books about it and talking in TV about it and whatever. Le at least it maybe in the 60s or 70s. Or at least, it's not, I don't know. It's and not so, so much culture. I mean, I, I already told you, if it happened to American woman, to white woman, I see to your American woman, in the first place, General MacArthur and all those allied forces who are in power to decide who are the war criminals would not have <coughs> ignored this. So the, it's not so much of a cultural issue, it's a racial, political, class discrimination. It still goes on here. You know, um, 15 years ago, I did a piece that was nominated for a national award for investigative reporting about the sex abuse at West Point's daycare center. Um, in fact, I interviewed Rudolph Giuliani for an hour, and uh, he was the Southern District Attorney at the time. There was physical medical evidence in the U.S. Army Hospital of the abuse of 11 children. And the New York Times refused to report it. Um, I found out by quite a quirk, and I had to, again, I went to trailer parks to interview these people. They had no money. They were the children of the janitors. and. God knows what else. I booked them on the Donahue show. They told their story. Um, I wrote the article, and it wasn't until I called D Giuliani's office and said, this story's going to be in national media, that he talked to me. He gave me an interview. And 
what's interesting is you're right. It occurred to me, and this took place, by the way, in 1985, the abuse, and it was documented, and the parents went on, these lower middle class people, if that, to win a civil suit, they won millions of dollars. Each family won a million dollars. Believe me, they, they, you know, that wasn't even enough after what I saw the videotapes of the children discussing the abuse. And by the way, it was two women who committed the abuse. Uh, when I asked Mr. Giuliani why these women weren't put in a computer bank, he didn't quite have the answer. Um, you know, I think everyone should know about that. Uh, he wasn't too concerned. Again, I said, my son was a year old at the time, and I came back, I was horrified, and I said, if these people, they were white, but if they were upper middle class, if they were the children of doctors and lawyers and people with means, that would have been all over the New York Times. You can be sure it would be on page one, like the New York Times put the McMartin case at the time. So I think you're absolutely right. It's a little bit jarring to try to understand how this couldn't have come out. But let me ask but you this, me, let me you know, can you, we, because our time's running yeah, short. Yeah, but let me tell you, you know, this, uh, why we are at that point. So silence has been broken only for about seven, eight years. Half a century silence was broken. And just now, people like myself, to tell the stories of this woman, these painful, these sorrowful stories, making documentaries and writing a book. And uh, the thing that gets me every time and gets me most sad and angry is when mainstream publishers or mainstream festival programmers or broadcast programmers, when I present a project like this to them, when they say, hasn't there been a work already done on this? As if one work on this issue is enough. It's just the beginning to come out. There has to be thousand more pieces of work. Can you count to how many pieces of work have been done on Holocaust? This is the, one of the most horrible, cruel Holocaust. But people say it has been done. One, two books. Hasn't there been one book already written? Hasn't there been already a documentary already made on this topic? So if you wanted to talk about the discrimination in 1950 and now, whether it is getting better, mm -hmm. I mean, Get that, okay? So before time runs out, I want to be sure to say this to you guys. Well, we'd out like to there, know where to see it. Out there, <laughs> uh, I made this documentary. It's called The Silence Broken, Korean Comfort Woman. And first of all, in this area, there are three very bright community young women who are doing their very best to set up uh, New York State Film Office in New Paltz. And as a kickoff event, they are going to present my film at Rosendale Theater on the 12th of March at 1 o'clock. <coughs> so you can come and see my powerful documentary. I'm sorry I'm calling it powerful, but people told me it was. And um, uh, it's on 35 millimeter, gloriously, beautifully haunting, compelling uh, visual and the good sound. So it's a real movie that you're going to see for 90 minutes. And then after that, we're going to hold the book signing party. And the book is the same title, Silence Broken, Korean Comfort Woman. They are designed to be a companion to each other, but to, be, to stand on its own. And then on the 18th of May, PBS will feed this nationally uh, throughout the country. 18th is Thursday at uh, 10 p.m. it will go out on public broadcasting system throughout the country. So I would like people to mark that date and watch this thing. And then the book, you can always buy it through Amazon.com. And in this area, in the bookstores, we are trying to uh, put in the Barnes and Noble and Borders and all Who of that. Who publishes the book? Uh, it's a very small Midwestern publisher called the Mid Pereira Books. And um, big mm -hmm. publishers wanted to, they were very attracted to this. But what they said to me, I was telling, was wasn't there a book already done? <laughs> publishers so, always say yeah. that. What's the name of the book? 
Korean it's comfort a, it's woman. A it's a silence called. broken Korean comfort woman, and it is also going to be sold at Ariel Bookstore, A R I E L, in New Paltz. You can come and have a good cup of coffee at Starbucks, and there is a bookstore. You can buy that. But first of all, you have to come see my movie at Rosendale Theater at one o'clock on the twelfth of March, and then PBS May eighteenth yeah, at ten uh, p.m. Okay. Thanks a lot for your coming by, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. I, I wish that I had been able to screen, you had been able to screen it, but we couldn't. Um, thanks again, folks, for joining me, and I hope you'll join me again next week for the Joanne Michaels Show, Speaking Out on the Unspeakable.